Hey, you're watching The Intersection, where faith, life, and culture meet. I'm Eric Targe. And I'm Justin May. And joining us today, we are so psyched to oh, have... Thomas. Yep, the author of Holy Sexuality in the Gospel, Dr. Christopher Ewan. <laughs> Hello. Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us. Yes, here uh, in the Zoom chat room. Mm. Well, we, we wanted to ask you a few questions about uh, your book. One of the big things that we love to do on the intersection is do these little things we're called You Should Read. And we just wanted to ask you, can you tell us a little bit about the motivation behind uh, holy sexuality and the gospel, uh, writing this book? Like, what, why did you write it? And what sets this book apart from all other books about Christian sexual ethic? You know, I would say 10 years ago, there probably were just a small handful of books addressing uh, the, the topic of homosexuality from a gospel-centered approach. Um, I, I think there are a lot of stories out there, uh, and I think those are so important to read because we're hearing the narrative of, of people um, who embrace their sexuality, walking away from the Christian biblical ethic, from God's intent for marriage between a man and a woman, and, and they're talking about how they're so happy and, and uh, you know, it's, you know, find it all over the place, whether it's on Hollywood movies, YouTube channel, anywhere. And, um, and we don't hear enough of these stories. Uh, so I did that with my mom. I talked about my story with my mom. But then what I found kind of lacking was there were a, a bunch of books or some books that were talking about the, the ethic and, and defending that. So important. And going over the different passages um, and, and talking about the biblical clarity of how the the authors of scripture, uh, the human authors inspired by God himself, um, the Holy Spirit, to record these verses that clearly condemn same-sex sexual behavior is sinful. But I saw lacking that uh, although we had passages that were doing the exegetical work and looking at these biblical passages, that there was not almost there were not any books addressing this from a theological perspective. And I don't know about you, Eric, but when I went to Moody in 2001, I was a brand new Christian. I knew very little about, about Christianity, the Bible. And so um, I was a Bible major and I thought, why do we have a Bible department and a theology department? Aren't they the same? I mean, I th and yeah. I think that's probably a pretty common question. I didn't understand that as a freshman. I, I thought there, uh, you know, what, what's, what's the difference? And as I studied further in, in, at Bible college and in seminary, I realized there is a difference, you know, and I'd like to explain it this way, um, like the Bible department and biblical studies, exegesis, hermeneutics is we're studying the trees, whereas theology, it's, it's important, the, the study of trees, but you also need to study the forest. Now, Dr. Yuan, uh, I think all of us kind of understand why it is that you would want to study the tree. As a Christian, we should all be wanting to study the trees, wanting to study the books in the Bible and the verses. Right. But what attracted you to that particular forest of sexual ethics and understanding of theology of sexuality? Can you tell us a little of your story? I, I know it's out there, it's online, but if you can give yeah. us a little bit of a taste of that. Yeah, well, definitely. And, and, and just real quick, I think um, the, one reason with, you know, when you're studying the trees, you're, and especially the six different passages, Genesis 19, Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20, Romans 1, 1 Corinthians uh, 6, and 1 Timothy 1, those are the prohibitions against same-sex sexual behavior. Important, but as I often tell people, we cannot build a Christian life on God's no. So what is God's yes? Well, you look at the full accounts of scripture and it tells us what God's yes is. And therefore that's what holy sexuality is. And we'll talk, which we'll, we'll talk about in a second. But my story, I was not a Christian, not raised in a Christian home. And um, I wrestled with my sexuality from a young age. I didn't come out to my early twenties, which now is later than normal. And when I came out, I was, I'm from Chicago and I um, was going to dental school in Louisville, Kentucky. I, after a year of dental school, I came home to Chicago told my parents. And through that crisis, my mother came to faith and then my father came to faith, but I went in the opposite direction. One, and I thought they'd lost their minds. Good for you, not for me. Hmm. And um, I, unfortunately, while in dental school, I began experimenting with drugs. And again, not all gays and lesbians do drugs. I'm just telling my story. And <laughs> regrettably, regrettably, it involves drugs and promiscuity, but uh, that's not always the case. 
But I started doing drugs. I started selling drugs. I eventually was expelled from dental school. I moved to Atlanta, Georgia. I kept selling drugs. And this whole time, my parents had no clue that I was doing drugs. But what I loved about their, what they didn't do was that they did not focus on legalism. They knew my biggest sin was not being in a same-sex relationship, but they knew my biggest sin was unbelief. And they prayed to the Lord that for my salvation. They prayed that I would submit to the Lord Jesus Christ and put my faith in him and follow him. So they prayed for that miracle, but things got worse. Oftentimes, as parents know, they will pray and pray and things just aren't getting better. But they just committed not to focus on hopelessness. They, I was in Atlanta. They came to visit me one time. I kicked him out. My dad gave me his Bible. I threw it in the trash can. I mean, I just despised anything that had to do with Christianity or religion or God. And it was so obvious that I was totally hopeless. And my parents, they just committed to focus upon his faithfulness and his promises. Uh, my mother fasted every Monday for seven years. Wow. My parents fasted 39 days on my behalf. She enlisted several of her friends, uh, many over 100 people from church from her Bible study fellowship group that she was very involved with. Uh, she was a leader there and, and um, they just prayed for a miracle. And that miracle came with a bang on my door. I was arrested, found myself in jail. And um, I, of all things, a few days after that, I was go passed by this garbage can in jail. And uh, there was a Gideon's New Testament on top of the trash, picked it up, began reading it. And it just began to convict me. It was not good news for me at first. Things got worse. I was, I found out I was HIV positive, kind of, rock bottom. And after um, a few days after that, I was sitting in my bunk bed and I was looking at the metal bunk above me and somebody had scribbled something. Uh, if you're bored, read Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. And, and although God wrote that to a rebellious nation, Israel, in their exile, um, God was also communicating to me that if he had, could have a plan for this very rebellious nation of Israel, he could have a plan for me. I don't know where that plan was going to take me, um, and, and yet God gave me enough faith, enough strength to get through that one day and the next. And it was in prison. It was, it was a long time. It, you know, People always ask me, when do you, did you become a Christian? I don't really know. It was not a, a night and day, you know, I, you know, I got on my knees, said a sinner's prayer. It was just gradual thing and of God just just peeling away the layers of, of hard hardness and, and stubbornness. Uh, but it was somewhere in, in that year where I just realized not only that, that God was Lord, but that his, that God's ways are good and righteous and, and, and holy and not a burden as, yeah. as John says in first John. Uh, so, and, and it was important that it was there in prison that I came to this realization that this goal that, that we sometimes lift up of, of heterosexuality is just, it's not the right goal. And, so I talked a little bit about that in my first book, Holy Sexuality, uh, or I, in my first book, Out of a Far Country, and I had a chap chapter called Holy Sexuality, and I always knew that I needed to flesh that out more, and um, so it took me a few years to do that, but uh, finally did that in this book. And that's awesome. I mean, so there's like at least six episodes worth of material to unpack in what you just said. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, there's so much good stuff there, yeah, there is. Uh, but we'll keep it. I'll try to keep this train on the tracks and not yes. ask a bunch of other questions. So, but you just mentioned you had the one chapter that ended up kind of becoming a whole book. Can you kind of tell us like what, what is the definition of holy yeah. sexuality? Great question. You know, that it was, it, it grew out of my frustration with this, um, this paradigm that Christians we have pigeonholed our, ourselves into. And what is that paradigm? It's this secular paradigm, which is the paradigm of heterosexuality, bisexuality and homosexuality. It's this framework. And we feel like uh, when we're talking about homo when we're talking about sexuality, that's the only framework that we've kind of forced ourselves into. Um, and therefore we come up with this conclusion. Uh, the first part is true that homosexuality is not God's will. That's true. But it's that second part that is not precise enough. What do I mean by this? When we say homosexuality is not God's will, that's true. But then we jump to the other conclusion and say, so therefore heterosexuality is, and we even defend it and say, well, the Bible created, I mean, in the Bible, you know, we have in Genesis one that God created Adam and Eve in Genesis two, not Adam and Steve, you know, Christians will say, which by the way, that's not helpful when you talk to gays. <laughs> as we no, say, it is not. <laughs> that, don't that paradigm. But as Christians, we know, you know, that, and, and we'll even defend it and say, God created Adam and Eve. And so therefore, it's heterosexual. The problem with that is 
heterosexuality is too broad. Mm -hmm. That includes sinful behavior. And so I knew that we needed to be in a world of infinite shades of gray. And if you guys could hold up your book, my book is, what color is it? Black and white. Why is that? Not because I couldn't think of anything more creative. Not because, you know, it was, I couldn't, you know, we oh, that's interesting. budget. It's because we're living in a world of infinite shades of gray. Like actually it was a whole play on that whole thing. We are, it's not just 50 shades of gray. <laughs> and today, I mean, it's getting more and more and more, just do whatever you want to do. And just, you know, as long as it, you know, you do you. And I, and I wanted to communicate not only through the pages of my book, but actually even through my cover that God's truth, God's, God's vision of sexuality is black and white. So that's how kind of holy sexuality in the gospel came out just through, I, I want us to see that instead of leaning into and borrowing and depending on the secular framework, we need to actually depend on the framework that God gives us, which is holiness, sanctification. It's either you're holy or you're not. Yeah. Dr. Ewan, I, I love oh, what you actually, just said. Sorry. I think... and, and, and so I didn't give the definition. <laughs> so oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, so the actual definition of holy sexuality is uh, it's chastity and singleness or faithfulness in marriage. Because we see that actually, um, you know, what is God's vision from beginning of Genesis all the way to Revelation? If you're not married, if you're single, then you're re to remain sexually abstinent. If you are married, and again, I'm going to be really clear that the only definition of marriage is between a man and a woman is uh, to be, uh, you know, is that if you're, if you're married, then be faithful to your wife uh, or, or be faithful to your spouse of the opposite sex. So chastity and singleness or faithfulness in marriage. Well, Dr. Yuan, I was just saying, I love what you did uh, in your book here. I'm looking at the, the section, God's Good Intent for All, because I love how you kind of break that out. And I just want to share a, a portion of the book, because I think you, you bring out such a good point about, uh, about how the Old Testament and the New Testament don't idolize or idealize uh, heterosexuality over homosexuality, as though all heterosexual uh, activity is good. You mentioned, I'm um, looking at page 45 to 46, in the Old Testament, we read about the incest of Lot's daughters with their father the rape of Dinah by Shechem, the fornication of Samson with the prostitute, the adultery of David and Bathsheba, the incestuous rape of Tamar by Amnon, uh, and the harlotry of Gomer, Hosea's wife. And in the New Testament, we're told about the incest and adultery of Herod, the prodigal son with prostitutes, the unmarried Samaritan woman living with the sixth in a series of men, and the church in Corinth boasting about a man who has his father's wife. And I look at that and it's like, oh, those are all heterosexual yeah. sins, right? Those are all sins, uh, but they're heterosexual, and that doesn't make them any better than, than homosexual sins. It's all sin. And I, I love how you bring that out, because I think that's, that's probably what's a little bit missing when it comes to a theology of sexuality. Just looking at, rather than just those verses, looking at the theme of what holy sexuality is. Amen. Yep. Yeah, the, no, not to step on you, I, I just think anybody who's ever done any, any counseling, you know, or, or just talk to people who are hurting, parents of... Uh, children who have come out to them, you know, you you sometimes hear this, whether they say it explicitly or not, I just want my son to be straight. If only he mm. could just get with a girl and like, like whoa, yeah. that's, no. <laughs> that's, even a, that's even a story that you tell. I love that story at the beginning of, of that chapter. Do you remember, can you tell us that story again? I begin that story and, and, and I wish this weren't true, but uh, like Justin, you were saying, I mean, that's, that's that's not an uncommon story. So it was a mother comes to me. She was so broken. She had just found out her son was uh, had, had shared with her that she was gay. Uh, he was gay and was also in a relationship. And she came to me. She was sobbing. Like it wasn't just crying. She was um, she could barely breathe. And I, I probably sat with her for several minutes before she could just uh, you know control her breathing and be able to get words out. But she told me like the first thing that came out of her mouth was I wish my son was normal. And it was kind of like from there, I kind of already knew, but I, I, I wanted to hear more of her story. I didn't want to jump to any conclusions, but it was. And, and, I, and I told that story and it, that particular story because she also then told me that, you know, I wish my younger son who's gay was like my older son who's normal. And I asked her a little bit more about, more about her family situation, about her son. Her older son was about, you know, to have a, a child and it was her first grandchild. She was so excited. And then, you know, and I asked, 
her, her, how long has your older son been married? And she said, oh, he's not, <laughs> you know, and, and, and I, and I think I, I, this is what I said in the book, you know, somehow in, in her, in, in this grief of this mother, her moral compass got thrown off. And I think mm. it's because we have made heterosexuality, and again, I want to be clear, it is the right direction, but it is too broad. When we're needing to use a laser, we're using the shotgun. And, mm. and again, when, if we're be, using a shotgun, that we're just being just as ambiguous as the world, and we cannot be in a world that is just begging for. When our youth, they're crying for clarity, we're giving them this, this soupy mess of saying heterosexuality. And so that's why I, I think we have to be super precise and clear when it comes to sexuality. That's, man, that's such a good word. Yeah. I, that sort of kind of leads leads at least me thinking about, okay, so we do have people in close proximity, whether it be a family member, oh, a yeah. coworker, a friend, with people who share a, a different sexual ethic, somebody who has different mm -hmm. values. Especially what, now in quarantine, right? You have family right. members that are coming back from college uh, or from different mm -hmm. areas. Some have been laid off, they're moving back home because they can't pay their rent. And there's this, this all of a sudden openness that people didn't have to deal with, or maybe it's a new openness that this is the first time they're they're confronting of a different sexual aspect. Yeah, I mean, what what can Christians do to help? I mean, just just speak biblically and lovingly mm -hmm. to somebody who is coming at it just from a very very different worldview. Well, I think um, you know we need to look at the example of Jesus Christ. Um, you know, one of one of my favorite passages in the Bible. This that might not really be in the Bible. <laughs> Uh, there's debate about that. John 7 and, and 8, uh, you know, with uh, uh, the, the woman caught in adultery. Um, you know, I, it, it's just amazing what happens there that, that he showed her compassion. And, um, but of course, he did not just say, you know, go and be happy. You know, he said, go and sin no more. And that's such an important thing that, that he showed her compassion first and, and in a sense earned the right to speak into her life. And I think that's a, that's a good example. Same thing with the woman, uh, the Samaritan woman, you know, the woman at the well, um, he sat with her, Jesus sat with her and, and spoke with her and, mm. and showed her compassion and, and talked. And even, I mean, remember he, that this is a woman, a Samaritan woman, and Jesus actually stopped and talked to her and asked her for water and, and had this conversation with her, uh, you know, building that, that, you know, even though it was a short time, but kind of building some, that connection and then speaking into her life, you know, calling her out that, that she's, you know, been in a line of men and this man she's with now isn't even her husband. But I think we have to recognize that sometimes there's this pre-evangelism that we need to work on. Again, our, our, our loved ones who, are, who identify as gay, uh, this, this is not their, um, their biggest problem. Their biggest problem is that they do not follow Christ, that it is, it is unbelief. And, and, and so I think it's, it's, it's having these conversations, but I think sometimes you just need to listen. Listening is not this equivalence of condoning or affirming. If you listen to someone, it does not necessarily mean you're affirming what they're doing. So I think uh, sometimes just listen to their stories. Tell me a little bit more about you know, especially as a, as a mom whose maybe son came out and, and then the mom now feels like, I don't even know you anymore. You know, how long have you been wrestling with this? So just simply tell me, tell me more what it was like, you know, it must have been hard keeping this in and just asking and just listen. You don't have to say, well, you know what I think about this, or you don't have to say, you know, well, you know what the Bible says. Maybe you could save that for another conversation. Yeah. Well, that's such a good word. I know that uh, I, I want to ask one more question we, that we, that we were thinking about. And I realized this one might open a can of worms that maybe leads to a few more questions, but, but we'll see. I, I, I think of so many parents that I've talked to and, and people I know who, who would say, listen, we, we want to love people the way that Dr. Yuan and Rosaria Butterfield and Sam Albury and all those people are, are talking about, but it seems that those people aren't coming to us is what they're saying. How can we create a culture either in our homes or in our church where people feel safe to, to open up about their struggles, to open up about, hey, this is, this is something that I'm wrestling with. I'm, we're, just, we're just curious, what do you think about that? How does the church work 
to, to really allow for that culture where, where we can bear our burdens and people don't have to, to fear about sharing short things. Yeah, short of compromising orthodoxy. Right? Yes, and without, that's the caveat. Yep. yeah. Totally, yes. <laughs> yeah, Help us do that without compromising. Right, exactly, we never want to do that because oftentimes um, we're either full of grace and at the expense of truth or we're full mm. of truth at the expense of grace. But then we see Jesus came, John 1, 14, full of grace and full of truth. And that's hard for us. Like, well, that's a tension for us. I mean, Jesus had no problem with that, being full of grace and full of truth. We struggle with that. I think, um, you know, how I would answer that is actually, you know, the answer to that is really just good theology. Mm. And, and I know so, for so many people, like, I don't want theology. I just want, you know, to get practical because uh, we've built this misunderstanding about theology, that theology is theoretical and it's philosophical and it's all heady, um, uh, you know, but it's not practical. And that's so far from the truth. I don't, I don't know about, if you remember Dr. Zuber, he was my theology professor and he was one of my favorite uh, theology professors. He talked about, he said theology should, should actually, he, he likes to think about theology as a verb. You do theology. It's not something that just just knowledge, which actually the, theology, that's what it means, knowledge of God. Uh, but it's, it's not just knowledge, you do it. And, and he said that bad theology leads to apathy. Good theology, talking about theology that gives, that broadens your understanding about the character and the immense attributes of God compels you into action. And that's what I want to do with my book, that, that this theology that we're talking about would actually drive us into uh, just action to, to, to go preach the gospel and, and to go love on others. But so what do I mean by this? I, you know, we can't understand human sexuality unless we begin with theological anthropology. And that can be, you know, a whole nother talk, but theology, theological anthropology, I can break that down to two important things. One is we're created in the image of God. And second, we all have been impacted by the fall, you know, the original sin, indwelling sin, actual sin. And so when we understand it like this, first of all, we, we recognize every person is created in the image of God. And we have to communicate that, that everyone, different from being a child of God, a child of God is someone who is redeemed, who is adopted by God to be a child of God only because of the finished work on the cross. So that's different, child of God. But every person is made in the image of God, whether they're a Christian or not, meaning every person who's identifying as gay and rejecting God's ways and rejecting Christ, they're still creating an image of God and they have value and dignity. However, we also recognize that every person um, has a sin nature. We've all, we, you know, ever since birth. And when we communicate it like that, there, there needs to be, there's a trend today where people want to try so hard, especially because, you know, they're not a person like me. And so they can't say they have same-sex attraction. They say, I don't really know what it is. And there's a lot of Christian Bible scholars and, and people who are in ministry now that are trying so hard to do that. Like they don't want to. So they want it. What they want to do is build this bridge, they call it, or find this common ground. And so they want to be gracious in their tone and everything, which is, which is good and important. But this is, I really believe we don't need to build a bridge from us to the gay community, because if, you know, we don't need to find a common ground because actually the Bible has already found that common ground. And you know what that common ground is? We're all sinners. <laughs> we yes. all, we all, you know, have a sin nature. We're all the same. The biggest problem is not my sexuality. The biggest problem is unbelief. And, and because, and because of my sin, I need to believe in God and rely on the grace of God. I love what John Piper says about grace. Grace is not just forgiveness of sins. It is the ability to sin no more. So therefore, it's not just pardon, it's power. So every single day, I need to rely on that power, no different from any of us. So the more that we communicate that sexuality, uh, homosexuality, same-sex attraction, or whatever, is not on a totally different uh, playing field. It's all the same, that all sin struggles are the same. And the, as we communicate that, then people hear that, and then they realize, man, I mean, I'm really no different. You know, I have same-sex attraction and I'm so scared to tell anyone, but I'm no different from this guy who's really open about the fact that he's wrestling with pornography or, or her, she who's wrestling with, you know, whatever it is, you know, with, with lying or, or gossiping. And, you know, at the end of the day, every one of us, we are all great sinners, but praise the Lord, we have an even greater savior. And so I think that's what we need to do. Starting with good theology is always the best, best way to go.
That's a, such a wonderful note to end on. Thank you. Thank you for, for your books. Thank you for being willing to talk to us. Yeah. Um, just that reminder, like we're all, we're all in this together. We're all yeah. in the same struggle and we all have to lay everything that we have, everything that is, that is weighing us down and, and an encumbrance and lay that at the foot of the cross, whether that be yeah, a yeah. sexual issue, uh, another issue, yeah. you know, I mean. Yeah. Well, thank awesome. you so much for, for watching this video at the intersection. If you liked this video, very simply, please just press like, uh, subscribe to this channel. In fact, you can, uh, if you go a little bit lower down into the info section, we encourage you to, to please buy Dr. Yuan's book. We're going to have that down Oops. here. Holy Girl. Sexuality, as well as Out of a Far Country. We'll also put a link there to one of his other uh, talks about his testimony if you want to go further into that. Again, Dr. Yuan, thank you so much for joining thank you, us. Thank you. Thanks for having me on, guys. Appreciate it, man.